Well, good morning. It's great to be here. Congratulations to Don on the 25th anniversary for IPT. It's quite an accomplishment. Anything for 25 years is quite an accomplishment. Uh, before we get started, let me invite everybody to just turn to the people sitting next to you or near you and tell them what, just take a minute, tell them what you think you're going to learn here today or what you're hoping to learn. <laughs> okay. Anybody willing to share what they came up with, what they're hoping to learn here today? Anybody? You guys suddenly got so shy. <laughs> yes. I'm a senior at age 66, and uh, besides uh, promoting financial education, uh, it helps you do checks and balances and find yourself at this age. So it's a little bit selfish. OK, so he's being selfish. <laughs> That's good. Uh, anybody else? Can't even see. Yes. And expanding what you learned yesterday. OK, well, we'll do a little bit of that. Today, what we're going to do is really to focus in more on the whole zone of, <coughs> of women. But I will say that when we talk about women, we're talking about families. We're talking about the relationships between women and men. So although the focus is on women, it's about women and men together trying to go through life as equals, as partners in some cases, but as equals. So can everybody see me if I'm down here? OK. So about hmm, several years ago, I went river rafting with my son, Zach, for the very first time in my life. I'd never done it before, but I thought, how hard can it be? So we found ourselves in Costa Rica on the Pacuari River, uh, and it was a gorgeous day. I mean, the sun was shining. The sky was bluer than you can even imagine blue could be. Uh, there were literally monkeys swinging from the trees. There were parrots flying over our head. And my son sitting next to me, and I'm thinking to myself, Life does not get much better than this. And then, like way up ahead in the horizon, I saw this like thing in the water just kind of like spinning around. I, I, I had no idea what it was. But then suddenly, the guide yells out, OK, we're coming up to a five. And I'm thinking to myself, five? What's a five? And he says, OK, we can go right through it. We're going to get a little wet, but we're not going to capsize. Or we can go around it and great get great pictures. So everybody except me was yelling, let's go right through it. Let's go right through it. And before I even knew what was happening, that's what we were doing. And the guy's yelling, paddle, paddle, paddle. And then to people like me, he goes, hold on tight, hold on tight. And before I knew it, we were luckily on the other side without capsizing. Now, I got to tell you, I was really scared. And I began to realize that besides my son, the most important person on that raft was the guide. Why? Because he'd been down that river thousands of times before. None of us ever had been down that river before. He knew exactly what was up ahead and how to navigate the turns, the twists, what we needed to do to get to the next place. And what happened was we actually began to enjoy ourselves because he would educate us, basically inform us, give us the information we needed to make smart choices along the way. So why am I telling you this story? Because in many ways, you, all of you sitting here in this room, you will be the guides for women, for men too, but for women. You know, we have never had large numbers of women becoming more and more financially empowered. And that's what we're experiencing here today, women becoming more and more financially empowered by the moment and needing the skills, the knowledge, the expertise to navigate that journey of life as effectively as possible. So let's get started. Uh, the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at four dynamic forces that are really helping to shape women and their experience around money. And as Carrie alluded to, uh, we recently did 
a huge study on women and money, all age women, but it was about women, money, and long life. That was the focus. And a lot of the information that we gathered, it was just, we finished it in late April, uh, I'll be sharing with you today. So let's get started. Let's begin by recognizing the fact that we don't often think about this, but we have seen women move from economic dependency to economic power. Now, it's not something that crosses our mind every day, but we really have experienced it, and we are part of that great experiment. Uh, what we've seen happen is that in the past, uh, women, your grandmothers, maybe not your grandmothers, maybe your great-grandmothers, uh, could not own property. Uh, they couldn't hold a bank account until the 1880s, let alone an investment account, and they couldn't vote to change any of these things. And that's pretty much the way life was. Uh, frankly, if these things didn't happen, we wouldn't be sitting in this room here today. Also, women were not encouraged to get education. Sure, there were some women who did, but they were generally from wealthy families or considered renegades. Uh, a few years back, I was one of the people on the Wall Street Journal's task force on women in the economy. And one of the other women on this task force was an older woman, and she was telling us a story about what it was like for her when she graduated law school. She graduated law school number three in her class at Stanford University. Great law school, right? You'd think she'd get millions of offers. Well, she sent out more than 40 resumes. And when she sent out those resumes, she got zero interviews, zero. Finally, she was able to get a job working as the deputy DA in San Mateo County, California, only by saying she would not take a salary and she would share a desk with a secretary. By the way, that woman was uh, former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. So that's how much the world has changed. And that path has already been paved so millennial women can take it for granted. It's great news. Today, we've seen a bit of a flip-flop. We've seen while women couldn't get educated in the past, today, they're getting more educated than men, graduating from college in higher numbers, graduating from grad school in higher numbers than men. So it's kind of a good news, bad news thing, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. By the way, that young woman sitting in the middle there, that's our daughter, Casey, who graduated from USC in this picture. And we were lucky. She went on to have a job, which is good <laughs> news, yes. And then recently, just last year, she went back to college. She went to the London School of Economics to get her master's degree, like so many other women her age, getting that education to gain the skills and the knowledge so that they can succeed, become business leaders like yourself, educators, uh, become doctors, lawyers, and financial advisors. I mean, they can do all the things that our grandmothers could never even dream of. That's how much things have changed. And by the way, the good news is that this is not just happening in the United States or westernized countries. This is a worldwide phenomenon. Now, it's not happening everywhere, and certainly things still need to change in many, many places. But what many countries are finding is that if you educate young girls and women, you actually increase GDP. I think there's something. Hi. Yeah.
So yes, this is a social justice issue and it really matters, but the action that's taking place right now in many third world countries, because it's not just the right thing to do, it's the bright thing to do. Changing the economies of countries. So all this education is great, but where does it lead to? Well, it leads to in the United States for the first time in the year 2010, nearly half of the US workforce was women. And they're not just entering the workforce, they're taking on positions of management, position, professional positions. They're moving up the food chain pretty dramatically. Have we gone as far as we need to? No, but we've made enormous progress. We've begun to see evidence that it's not just one or two women, but it's a critical mass of women who are moving away from just being responsible for the domain of house and home and moving towards taking on other types of economic power. In our lifetime, this is happening. And it's, we're, we're seeing it really catch fire. We've seen it in the media of this year with uh, Time's Up and Me Too, going beyond just sexual harassment, talking about the economic empowerment of women and how it's been growing and needs to grow even more. So not only are women holding these managerial and professional positions, they're also opening businesses in very large numbers. I know Carrie has a new book coming out on women entrepreneurs over, is it over the age of 50? Over 40. Over 40, and it's the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs out there. So we're seeing a huge, huge number of women take control of their lives and their pocketbooks. Uh, frankly, if my grandmother were alive today, she would not believe the changes that we have seen take place in our lifetime. What else? As a result of this education and entering the workforce and moving up the food chain, what we see is that there's been a remarkable growth in women's income. Now, as women's income has grown since the 1970s, men's, when you adjust for inflation, has remained rather flat. Now, I know before you start rolling your eyes and say, well, yeah, look where women started, that's where women started. Have, again, we haven't gone as far as we need to, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but we've made enormous progress, and that progress has resulted in the fact that 29% today of women out-earn their husbands. And if you look back at the 1965, you see that number was only 4.5% of the population. I think I heard a guy just say, that's great. <laughs> it is great. <laughs> it's good news. It's good news for partners. It gives more choice, by the way, not just to women, but to men as well, which is good news for everyone. Uh, now women account for $14 trillion in personal wealth. That's a big number. And what it makes us see is that, again, this isn't just about one or two women. It's about a critical mass of women getting educated, entering the workforce, moving into positions of power, and really changing the dynamics, giving women and the next generation of women an opportunity to stand side by side with men. So where does this lead us to? This leads us to the longevity revolution. Now, in many of your what you wanted to learn today, many of you said, oh, I want more about what happened yesterday, what Ken talked about. Well, this is a little bit about that. It's not everything, but it's just a little bit more we're going to dig down into. Uh, for one thing, Ken told you yesterday that we're living longer and better than ever before, and that's great news. It is mostly all good news, especially if we prepare for it correctly. But as you can see by looking at this chart, uh, women are kind of superior when it comes to longevity to men. They live about five years longer than men on average. Women are living to, on average, to 81 years old. Now, that's a lot of years. That's a lot of years to think about, to plan for, to have the opportunity to do all kinds of things in your life, including reinventing yourself along the way. 
but it raises a lot of questions too. The first question that comes to my mind is, well, how do you even define old when you're talking about people living into their late 70s, 80s, and beyond? Uh, before I tell you what we've learned in some of our studies, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person sitting next to you and tell them what, just very quickly, what age you think of as old. Just the number. Okay. What numbers? Can I hear a couple numbers? 80? 80? 90? 90? There seems to be a lot of 80s and a lot of 90s. Okay, well, that's, that's great. I like the positivity. <laughs> I was once speaking at a meeting of insurance people, and somebody yelled out, 29! <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> OK, so we have done a lot of studies, as Ken told you yesterday, about aging, longevity, retirement. I mean, we probably dug down deeper into that subject than any other company out there. And, uh, and we also are going to be sharing some, I'm going to be sharing some of the results today uh, from our women and money study that we recently completed. But one of our other studies, when we were focused on aging and longevity, we asked people this very question, well, how do you define old anyway? And what they basically told us is, whatever age you are, old is older than you are. <laughs> and I kind of agree with that. <laughs> but so what does it look like to be old? I mean, I don't know. What does it look like? What does it feel like? What are some of the things that happen? Well. Let's share with you. This is Shelly Keeling. She's 67 years old, and I think we could all agree she looks kind of great. Uh, yeah. She is a professional runner, so that would help explain it. But she's also a lawyer. Uh, but if you think Shelly looks amazing, check out her mom. Ida is 103 years old. Yeah. Now, what I find particularly amazing is that Ida wasn't always a runner. In fact, she didn't start running until she was in her late 60s. Uh, she was going through a hard time. She was going through a bit of depression. And when her daughter, Shelly, began to realize it, she came over to her apartment and she got her slowly getting up out of bed because she'd been in bed basically for the last six months. Uh, she got her walking around first the apartment, uh, then around the apartment building, uh, then around the, uh, the block until she caught fire. She realized, whoa, I really love running. And now Ida, who many of you might have heard of, is famous. She's the oldest woman sprinter in the world. And her message to everybody is, do not let age be an obstacle. Don't let it stand in your way. So physical vitality is important. We all know that. But is that the only kind of vitality there is? What about spunk and intellectual vitality? Here we have a great example, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ginsburg notorious RBG, uh, who says, people sometimes ask me, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? Have any of you heard her answer? OK, yeah. it's a great answer. My answer is when there's nine. <laughs> it's a great answer. So and then a lot of people, as Ken alluded to yesterday in some of his remarks, a lot of people say, oh, old, older people, they're not with it. They don't know what's going on. They're not like on social media or with it with tech. Well, mm, some of them are. Uh, here is Lynn Slater, who's 64 years old. She is a Fordham University professor, but she's also like a social media star. And she says, I'm not 20. I don't want to be 20, but I'm really freaking cool. That's what I think about when I'm posting. Now, what I find particularly exciting about this is not that she's on social media, not that she's posting and that she thinks she's freaking cool, although that is pretty nice, uh, but that young women 
are reading her posts as much as older women. Not only are they reading them, they're using her as a role model. I mean, how many role models did we have when we were growing up to age like this? Not enough. So she's helping to change the narrative of what it means to be an older woman. And here's another change in the narrative. Don't worry, I'll have a surprise. So what all these women have in common is that, sure, they've had setbacks and challenges along the way, but they've overcome them. And they've had to reinvent themselves sometimes along the way. Uh, but they've all persevered, and they've made the most of their lives. One of the questions we need to ask ourselves is, yes, each and every one of us, men too, you could live to 80, 90, 100 or more, and especially women whose longevity is a little superior to men. The question becomes, are you financially prepared? And it's a real question. And we, in our study, asked this very question. And we found out some very interesting and kind of alarming things. Uh, for one thing, we found out that 64% of women told us they want to live to 100. So yes, long life has a lot of appeal to people. What are their concerns? Well, the first concern that came to mind is, if I'm going to live to 100, chances are I'm going to outlive my money. And that's scary. But what was even more alarming was that 40% of women fear that they're going to run out of money by the age of 80. Now, what makes that pretty significant, didn't we say earlier that average life expectancy for women is 81? And that's average? So that's a little bit of a scary dynamic. But it's one, if we know about it, we can prepare for it better. Let's drill down into this just a little bit more. When the Wall Street Journal did a poll with executive women, and they talked to women who were in the sweet spot for saving for retirement, women between the ages of 56 and 65. And as you can see by looking at this chart, the number one toughest task that they identified was saving for retirement. More difficult than juggling work and family responsibilities, uh, caring for immediate family, but shockingly, more difficult than taking care of their own business. So this is not an easy thing to do. Let's not say, oh, well, we're just messing it up completely. No, this is hard work. And it's something that we do need to focus on. Uh, Anna Maria Lusardi, who's the academic director of the Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center at George Washington University. She was one of the experts that we relied on for information for our study. And she put it very succinctly. She said, longevity, it's the critical issue for women. Probably the biggest reason why women's needs are so different than men's. So living longer, yeah, it's a great opportunity, an opportunity to grow and learn and reinvent yourself. But there are some challenges along the way. And one of the biggest is preparing financially for that longer life. 
So let's continue. Let's take a look at women's life journey and the financial consequences. Now, this is a big one uh, because there's a lot of surprises along the way that don't really seem like surprises. They're sort of like hidden in plain sight. So this work is all from our most recent study, the one we just completed on women and money. And here's what we learned. We asked women if they thought their life journey was different than men. And as you can see, the majority said, yeah, it is. It's really different. And the question becomes, are there financial consequences? So before we get started on this, can you just turn to the person sitting next to you and just say what you think. Do you think that there are financial consequences? <laughs> so how many people said yes? There are financial consequences. And how many people said no? Nobody said no, but some people aren't sure, I guess. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's investigate. Let's see. Let's begin at the beginning of the life journey. Now, we're going to go through this life journey, and I want to say a few things about it before we do. Uh, first, there are other life stages besides the ones I'm going to talk about for sure, but we're just going to focus on some of the big ones. Uh, just to point out what some of the issues are that are hiding in plain sight. Uh, second, uh, in many ways, women's life journey is amazing and more richer and, frankly, a little more textured than men's at this point in time. And we see a convergence to a certain extent. We're seeing women and men life journeys become more similar rather than more disparate, but there are significant differences, and they do potentially hold some financial consequences, as you were about to see. Uh, and some of them can seem incredibly dire and make you feel, oh my God, what are we going to do? But what we're going to do is we're going to rely on people like you to help us solve this issue. And they are completely solvable. So let's take a look. The first place we're going to go on this life journey, we're going to look at early adulthood, parenting, caregiving, divorce, retirement, spousal care, and widowhood. Uh, let's take a look at early adulthood. Uh, early adulthood is so many ways a fabulous time of life for women. And women have come so far. Uh, they're graduating, as we said, earlier from college and grad school and higher numbers than men. It's boosting their career options, but it's at a price. What is that price? Well, when it comes to student debt, 64% of all student debt is held by women, in addition to which they start their careers a little later because they're being educated, which makes perfect sense, gives them great opportunity, but they're starting a little later. And we know it's hard or harder to save when you're dealing with those two things. Add to it the wage gap. Uh, let's take a look. We know we talk about that 82 cents to a dollar. We all know that. And some people even discount it. But what we don't talk about, which very few people even realize, is that wage gap, it accumulates over time. And so you could take a man and a woman, and neither of them taking any career breaks at all, in the same career from the beginning all the way through to retirement. By the time they reach retirement age, that woman will have accumulated $411,000 less than the man. $411,000. Let's go on. Let's take a look at parenting. Parenting is a great stage of life. Not everyone goes through it, not everyone, but 80% of all women, in fact, become parents. And the average woman has two children. So it's a great time of life. I know I feel so lucky that I have two amazing children. Uh, it's probably one of, the, it's one of the two highlights of my life. 
having those kids, uh, it made me feel so emotionally connected. And uh, the opportunity to be able to work and take care of my family at once was both challenging and a great opportunity. Fantastic, but it did have financial consequences. It also had tremendous emotional consequences. Uh, for those of you who are mothers, you may be able to relate. Whenever I was at work, I felt like I should be at home. Whenever I was home, I felt like I should be at work. Uh, at night, I would be like, write that proposal or read a bedtime story to my kids. It was choices continuously to the point where I felt like something's got to give. I've got to make changes. And when I did make changes, which was cutting back on work, it did have financial consequences. Um, lost promotions, my career track. I, I wasn't in the position to worry about lost position, promotions because I was an entrepreneur, but we were at the very beginning at a very exciting part of the development of Age Wave, and I really, my career track was affected, and it's still affected by this to this day. Uh, but women who are working for other companies, they lose promotions, they lose income, and then there's the mommy penalty, which is real. People sometimes discount it, but women who have children under the age of 16 have three, time the wa three times the wage gap as a woman who is not dealing with parenting. So it's got its financial consequences. What else? Caregiving. Caregiving is another place along the lifespan that women tend to do more than men. Two-thirds of all caregiving is done by women. And most women say, this is something that I really want to be doing. I feel honored to have the opportunity. It gives me a feeling of gratitude and purpose to help my parents or my grandparents or my in-laws or some relative of mine or even a friend. But the financial consequences are real. It can take your career off track again. It can also affect promotions. All the things that parenting affected can affect you in caregiving as well. In addition to which, there's out-of-pocket costs that Ken alluded to yesterday in his presentation. Uh, seven out of 10 caregivers take money out of their pocket to help the person they're taking care of. And on average, that number is $7,000. So it's a real thing. What else? Divorce. Well, not everybody goes through divorce, luckily. 48% of all marriages end in divorce. Uh, anyone here? I know I'm divorced. I was married once before. I had my starter marriage. <laughs> but uh, a lot of people do. But. Um, yeah, it's a real thing, and it's very, very stressful. It's one of the most stressful times of life. At the same time, women report feeling this tremendous sense of freedom. And after a while, even the opportunity to soar in ways that they maybe never had before. But there are economic consequences. Uh, for one thing, their household income. Uh, there's a little, there's an initial loss of income. There's out-of-pocket expenses, fifteen dollars to $30,000 worth of expenses. And uh, ultimately, divorced women get two times less Social Security than married women. And what about retirement? Now, retirement is a great time of life. As Ken was talking about yesterday, most people look forward to it. Uh, there's more fun. There's less stress. There's more happiness and contentment in retirement. And women get to retire for more years than men in general. On average, a woman retires two years earlier than a man. And as we know, she lives longer. So the good news is she gets more leisure, more freedom, more flexibility, the opportunity to be more. On the other hand, from a financial standpoint, there's Less savings, women have three times less savings going into retirement than a man. Uh, their benefits, less also. And they have more time in which they've got to make up for it. They have those extra five years of life to fund, which is no joke. What else? Another thing similar to caregiving is spousal caregiving. So am I overloading you yet? 
it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. But again, I think there's some solutions at the end of the rainbow. So let's keep going. Spousal caregiving is a real thing, too. Women, on average, marry a man still a couple years older than them. Again, more years of life for women. So not surprisingly, they are often put into a position where their husband's or partner's health begins to fail, and they want to help out. I mean, they feel like there's a certain amount of honor and dignity that comes with spousal caregiving, and they feel that it can deepen their relationship in a very positive way. But again, there are financial consequences very similar to the kinds of things that a caregiver for a parent or a grandparent goes through. But there's some more here, too, because sometimes you're depleting your actual nest egg so that if your husband were to pass away, you have less to live on afterwards. So let's just stop for a minute and go back to that wage gap. So we know that there's a wage gap, but we've just talked about it in terms of if a man and a woman work the same number of years. And we've just shown three instances where there's career interruptions. Now, not every woman goes through career interruptions, and certainly some men go through them too, but women are much more likely to go through career interruptions than men. Uh, and let's just take an example. Let's take a woman, and she's got a great job, but she takes off time, let's say four, six, maybe even eight years when her kids are born in her late 20s or early 30s, and then she goes back into the workforce. Uh, and then when she's in her late 40s, she gets a call from her mom and her dad, and they're both failing, so she takes off a little bit more time to care give them. And then when she's back at work again and in the swing of things, thinking that she might even work longer than expected, her husband gets ill, and she finds herself retiring a couple years earlier than expected. So she has these three career interruptions. What does that look like? It looks like this. The cumulative earnings for women versus men with interruptions is a huge number. It's over a million dollars. That's a million dollars. So there's one more life stage I want to focus on, and that is widowhood. And widowhood has been, we just finished a study on widowhood. In fact, I was talking to Carrie yesterday about, about that study. And it is, women say that it's the most difficult life stage that they have to go through, more difficult than anything else. Uh, they have grief, they have stress, but interestingly, dealing with the overwhelm of losing a spouse and with some of the financial consequences actually helps them build resiliency, helps them build a sense of courage that they never even knew they had. So what are some of those financial things that they have to deal with? Well, suddenly women are the sole financial decision maker and most women tell us that they've never been the sole financial decision maker or they haven't been since they were younger in their 20s. In addition to which, yes, they lose income, but they suddenly gain assets, assets that they, they may not even know where they are or how to deal with them, but they've got to step up to the plate and become the sole financial decision maker, and many of them are not prepared to do so. So when you put all these things together, what you see is women do have a life journey that is Full, it's rich, it's exciting, it's filled with texture and lots of family relationships, but it also has tremendous financial consequences. So before we go on, why don't you just take a minute to talk to the people at your table. What do you make of all this? <laughs> I noticed it being very quiet here. <laughs> so compared to men, what do you make of women's life journey and the financial consequences? Anybody willing to comment on that? 
Um, compared to men, how do you, what do you think about women's life journey and the financial consequences? Does that? Thank you. <laughs> okay, I saw it. So, um, my, I was still on my channel mates that my grandmother was this cycle. She, um, Hello? Okay. Hi. So, my grandmother <laughs> was the definition of this cycle. She, um, did not work in her early years while she was raising her daughters, so mm -hmm. she did not have the income that would have given her Social Security. Uh, my grandfather retired early and lost part of his pension because my grandmother got cancer. Oh, wow. Two years later, he had a massive stroke, and she became the caregiver. Wow. And he died before her, and they didn't work out the Social Security correctly, so she had a very minimal income. So she went from you know not having an income and not taking care of things but taking care of the family to all of a sudden taking care of everything, but having nothing. So I've, I've learned a lot watching wow. her and what not to do. <laughs> and then my mom is coming up behind her being the one who paid $3,000 a month out of her own pocket to take care of my grandmother yeah. when she was in assisted living. So you're living this, yeah. your family and, has and my, well, I brought my grandmother home to my house for hospice for the end of her time. Oh. I was lucky, I had a very understanding boss who let me work from home for a month and a half. But Amazing. Yeah, it's, so it's, we're living that. Wow, thank you. Yes. Have a hand over here. So, uh, you know, um, I'm Brian from Pennsylvania, and uh, we do a lot of investor education, coordination, and outreach. And so, so the stats that you presented are pretty startling, and I love the way you did it. I'd like to steal some of your materials. <laughs> but I, I think it's generally understood by women of all ages that we've reached out to, whether they're in high school and, you know, they seem so naive and young especially to me as I get older, uh, to all the way to the seniors that we work with, it seems like the, the base knowledge and the sentiment is generally understood. The question that, that I have and the challenge I face is how do I get people to take time out of their schedules to learn how to do something mm. about this? So there are ways to address it, but how do I get early adult caregiving, divorcees, people at each age to take time out of their schedule to learn about how to fix it. That's the challenge I've had. Yeah, it's a, it's a real challenge. Uh, one more, anywhere? Yes. Do you want to just wait one second? There's a mic coming up. You know, I was talking uh, with our group about a, the possible at-risk population then of yeah. women that have had no financial um, education um, are getting older. And then, so you, you know, all of a sudden being responsible without and needing to trust people. So yeah. for me, there was, you know, with that gap comes a very at risk part of our population. Yeah, I think that's 100% true. But at least if we can look at the problem the way it really is rather than trying to hide it, it's a step in the right direction. Okay, so there's one more piece to this puzzle before we turn the corner and talk about potential solutions that I want to talk about because not many people are talking about this either, and that is something that we call the wealth gap. Now, interestingly, the wealth gap, people don't, it's sort of this effusive thing that very few people even talk about. Uh, it's not on the radar screen of most people. So you say, what's the wealth gap? Well, it's accumulated not just earnings, but uh, assets and investments and things that come from fringe benefits. And these are things if, yeah, uh, that we call wealth escalators. And wealth escalators are really on ramps for building wealth. Now, I want to be clear, wealth gap, it, it really has nothing to do with being wealthy. It's about accumulating assets. And if you want to accumulate assets, you need to go beyond income. Income just is not enough. And there's a lot of focus on income, but not so much on wealth. And I know that there's at least a couple of financial advisors in the room who probably are very familiar with this. But 
the idea of having fringe benefits, government benefits, favorable tax codes, stock options, these all add to wealth. And as it turns out, men are far more likely to take advantage of these wealth escalators than men. So just getting that message out to people, like in at companies and such, would be a good thing because it would help women begin to understand, oh, I need to do something a little bit differently. So how do you compare it? I mean, it's a much harder to compare the wealth gap than the pay, pay gap men to women. But what we can do is we can compare single men to single women. And what we see is that the average single woman has three times less wealth than the average single man. So that's the wealth gap. So if you learn nothing else from today, learn that besides the pay gap, there is this wealth gap and that it's even more important than the pay gap. So the question we asked in the beginning, yeah, women's life journey is different than men, and clearly there are financial consequences. So let's turn the corner and take a look at empowering women's relationship with money and investing. Now, most of us know that you have to plan somehow into your future. I think we just skipped, whoops. I think we skipped a slide here. Yeah, here's the thing that really matters. 95% of all women are going to be financially independent at some point along their lives, so that they've got to prepare. So we asked women in our study, have you prepared? How far into the future have you prepared? And one of the startling findings was that, for some reason, a quarter of all women, all ages, have not planned at all financially into their future. Not at all. In addition to, we asked women, and you, you might ask, like, okay, so why? Like, why are women not paying attention to this? I mean, as we heard from, remind me what your name was? Brian. Brian. From Brian from Pennsylvania is that, you know, there is a lot of information out there on this, but what, what's happening? Why is it not integrating into, li into people's lives? And I think that there are several reasons why. One of them is it's kind of just in our culture, in the oxygen that we breathe. When we asked women, which would you rather talk about, death or money? And we all know women like to talk about everything. I mean, we talk to our friends and our family about sex and our relationships and our career tracks. But what we learned was women are more willing to talk about death than talk about money. And we know that they don't love talking about death. They just don't like talking about money. And by the way, it's not just women themselves, although they're part of the issue. Uh, another part of the issue is the media. We need more Carrie Hannans. One of the things we did in our study is we took a look at the January issue of 17 women's magazines, trying to see, well, what's the focus of these magazines? What are they talking about when it comes to finance and money? And what we found was, again, they talk about everything. There were so many articles. There were 839 articles in the top 17 women's magazines. It's a lot of articles, covered everything you can imagine, but everything except articles about personal finance and money. There was just one article so the media is complicit. They play a role, and they can really change things. They can have an influence on women taking a stand, women doing what Brian said that they're not doing, and that is making the time to really focus in on this, understanding the importance of it, because it's not just another thing on their to-do list. It's an important thing that should be at the top of the priority list. What else? This all feeds into this idea of financial confidence and the stereotype that's out there that, oh, women don't have financial knowledge, women don't have financial confidence. Well, we asked women, are you financially confident? And we were surprised to see that, yeah, when it comes to most financial tasks, women feel very con as confident as men. But there's one exception, and that is when it comes to 
investing. So this is the place where women don't feel confident, and it has an impact. Uh, the impact that it has is women don't invest as much as they'd like to. They walk away from it because they get paralyzed. They get scared. They're going to make a wrong decision. They maybe overthink it, as some people claim, or they just don't feel like they have the knowledge or the expertise or the guides to help them along the way. For example, women told us their number one financial regret was not investing more money. So they want to do it. They have confidence in most financial tasks, except for investing. So, and psychologists have shown us that confidence is a trigger in every kind of activity, not just in finance, but in all kinds of activity to take action. So if we can help women gain that confidence through knowledge, they might be investing more. What else? It's the financial services industry. Now, anybody here in the financial services industry? Yeah, a few of us. Okay, so the financial, there are certainly examples of great financial advisors out there who have the secret sauce, who really understand how to meet women's financial needs, and they're very focused on doing so and do, do a great job of it. But when it comes to financial services, many women feel very frustrated, feel very dissatisfied. Uh, they describe the industry overall as unwelcoming, full of jargon, as Ken mentioned yesterday, and very patronizing and male-oriented. In addition to which, which is probably way more important, they say most women think the, of the industry as defaulting to men's salaries, their life path, their life expectancy, their career track. It's focused on men. And just a great example, retirement calculators. Now, as part of our study, we looked at retirement calculators, all the retirement calculators out there. And what we noticed is that none of them account for time outside of the workforce. And we know that women have these career interruptions. In addition to which, to make matters worse, is the financial professionals who do meet with couples, they're not engaging with wives. For instance, when we ask financial advisors, well, what profession is the wife in and what charities does she care about, what we found is most of them don't know which is kind of crazy, especially in light of the fact that when we asked couples, how do you want to make your financial de decisions, they told us they want to share in financial decision making. So men want this too. So let's turn the corner. Let's take a look at, well, what do women really want? Let's see if we can try to meet those needs a little bit more effectively. Uh, women and men both care about performance. Let's not take that away. Uh, it's not like women don't care about this. They do. But women view money a little bit differently than men view money. Men usually think about their money and view money in terms of the numbers. Now, it's not like they don't care about the issues that women care about, but when they view money They'll use, or talk to their broker or advisor, they'll usually talk about it in terms of percent gain, percent loss, uh, how much money. That's what they're focused on. Women, they're focused on values, on family, on their career. How does it impact their career, their family, and the causes and issues that they really, really care about? When we asked women what's more important, accumulating as much wealth as possible or feeling financial security, they said that they wanted to feel financially secure, feel financial peace of mind. That was 10 times more important than accumulating as much wealth as possible. The one thing that we saw for sure, and this is where you all come into the picture, is not only for their kids, as Ken told you yesterday, do women want education. They want education for themselves. They want to be educated. And you know, one of the tricky parts is finding easy ways to do that, finding ways to do it. Because women do have crazy busy schedules. They're multitasking, caring for family, uh, 
trying to take care of their jobs. It's a lot, but we need to make this a priority for women. And the way they like to learn about this is through real life examples and stories. Yes, graphs and charts are important and they ought to be looked at, but these real life examples and stories really hit home for women. So what needs to be done? Uh, before I tell you, just turn to the people at your table or break up into twos and talk about two or three things that you think that you can do to help change the game here. Anybody come up with how, any thoughts on this? Yes, Anne. Can you just one second, There's, here's a mic so everyone can hear you. Thanks. Our table we're talking about sharing stories of their clients, what they did with other clients, how they worked through situations to, to come to uh, a good outcome or working on a good outcome, would you say? Yes. And values. And values. Great. So focusing on stories and values with women. Great. Thank you. Yes. Uh, work, workplace financial education, we think, is a, is a valuable tool. Yeah. Um, but along with that, you really have to have strong commitment from the employers themselves mm -hmm. and to provide incentives, tangible incentives, for the participants that kind of, you know, rewards them for completion, mm -hmm rewards them for completing things um, in, in, in a timely fashion, and celebrating successes as they go along. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried to invest in education in your workplace program. It was very, very successful in terms of attracting bodies to participate. Oh, However, when it came to actually completing all of the units, um, it, we had a less, a less degree of success. When I surveyed those programs around the country that were most successful in terms of uh, participation and completion, it was those that offered tangible incentives. As much as uh, employers have to start rethinking how we approach things, participants, you know, the women themselves yes. really have to start rethinking how they, uh, uh, how they approach um, learning and, and information. And by the way, a lot of the stuff that you're talking about for women, it applies equally to men. The difference yes. is the men's confidence level may be higher, but their smart level may not be, <laughs> may not be equal with their confidence. I'm yeah. telling you that. Yeah, you, you actually happen to be right there. <laughs> I would say in reaching out to women, our best impacts have been going where they are. Mm -hmm. So we were invited to speak at like the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, Red Hat societies, library groups, things like that. They may be smaller groups, but they are wanting your information and you're going where they are, so they're active audiences, as opposed to, we don't have very much luck at the workplace ones because you can see them just checking out, like, I'm supposed to be here for an hour, I don't wanna do this. But go where they are, that was the big thing for us. Great, thank you. I see another hand over here, Brent. Thank you. Uh, leveraging off the interest in talking about death and not so much about money, <laughs> just some kind of thing you could do with you know, the funeral or cremation industry. Uh, five things you need to talk about before you close that casket. <laughs> you know, just, to, just to say, like, so you're we're not, a you know, fun like I'm not available <laughs> to chat with you right now, but you sh we should have talked about these things <laughs> and have a real money, you know, life focused. Great, thank you. Anybody else before, yes, Sarah? Um, <laughs> you got just two, with, uh, do you have two things to say? <laughs> just with uh, social media and the, the one about the articles in the magazine, mm -hmm. like when you find something online, share it with your friends and family so that those media impressions um, grow and then people realize that People are reading about that stuff, and young people and old people and uh, older people. <laughs> but just keep sharing those articles so that they get more common. Great. Thank you. Anything? Anybody else? Yes. 
you know, the problem is the deliverable. We, we all recognize the problem. Yeah. It seems like the outreach is what is difficult. The program designed to keep their attention or to attract different generations. So it seems to me that our focus of attention really needs to start very early. Yes, so starting early, that's a good idea. Okay, any more? I see a half hand over there. <laughs> Oh. I agree about the uh, outreach is necessary, but I think as some of our agencies think about honing our messages, and I've been talking mm. to our agency, we've been looking more now, maybe moving a little less to investment fraud and more to investor education in Great. general about what, how we can market that message and maybe getting out guides or getting out articles or social media to kind of talk about this issue of, you know, women in finance and, and how things are need to be done. Great. Well, good. Well, these are all great ideas and things we need to do. Um, let's, let me give you my list, which is a little different than yours, but, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just gone and I went to Ken. Oh. And I got one more. Oh, sorry. I, I, I really didn't see either <coughs> of you. <laughs> yeah, I would add, too, that even when we raised our kids, we didn't quite know what to teach them. So if there was like a kit, even that we could have bought, or that maybe go to the local school or center and say, here's a seven-part lesson that you as parents can teach your kids about, mud, about debt and credit cards and paying their bills and living within their means, we might have, if we were given a little help as to how to do it, we probably would have done it. I, I, Maddie would say that coming out of these focus groups, a lot of the men would say, well, I'm not so sure how I feel about my wife being and really smart at this, but I really want my daughter to be. And um, oh, That was a very common so thing. So any way to get in sort of the vault there to get these kids better educated and maybe through the parents wanting to be helpful. So, no yeah. thought, thanks. Doing a very good job, by the way. <laughs> Okay, now you made me feel really stupid. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so, well, this is a really important subject. Uh, the one thing I want to say from the outside, it's not that this doesn't matter for men. It does matter for men, but because women live longer and they do have a life journey that's sort of old world and new world combined into one, uh, where they used to be financially dependent and now they're trying to be financially empowered, there's some bumps in the road. And it's not that they, we can't overcome them. We can, but we need some assistance. We need, some, we need guides. We need people like you. So let me go through my list really quickly. Um, I think we need to break that taboo about talking about money. So start with your friends and family. You know, Bring up uncomfortable money subjects and just talk about them. Let's begin to open up the conversation and not make it like, ooh, we can't talk about money. It's not a good thing to talk about. It's sort of socially incorrect. Let's change that. Let's also send the message, and many of you already said this, about planning for longevity. And planning for longevity doesn't just happen when you're 50 or 60 or... 80. It begins when you begin in the workplace. Early adulthood, we've got to get the message out and we've got to get education to young people, men and women. We need to understand, we need to acknowledge, and we need to let women understand that there are these points in their life that they're making decisions that have financial consequences. And they need to talk openly about them. Let's just give an example. Let's say a woman decides, she's, let's say she's partnered with a guy or another woman, whatever, um, and she decides that she wants to take off time to care for their kids. And that's the best thing for the family to be doing. Let's say that that's the reality. And let's say the man also is making some sacrifices but you know, she's taking the lion's share of the financial consequences. And so she needs to communicate that clearly. Okay, I'll take this time off from work, but let's recognize and acknowledge my career track is gonna be affected. So are my benefits and my future salaries. How are we gonna make up for that together as a team? 
And that's something that we need to begin opening up that conversation about. And then I'm going to put this on you guys. I think you have a role to play here as guides on that raft, leading us all to success, to help women feel protected, educated, engaged around money and their future self. Because yes, earnings are important because we really want to have a good present, but we also want to make sure we have a great future. And let's remember that you know, women have gone from this financial dependency to financial power and that it's not just one or two women, but it's a critical mass of women. And we need help along the way to get through these little bumps in the road that can sometimes even be sinkholes and that there really is still a trail left to blaze. So thank you, guys. Thank you.